Before I even start, I just want to say thank you to Dr. Constantino for really stressing that neurodiversity is about disability justice and intersectionality and the positionality of being a neurominority. So I want to just shout out a thank you there for, for that, um, that important piece of clarification. All right, now, now I'll get on to my own talk, but thank you. Um, so uh, as, as uh, they've, um, I've been introduced, so I'm a full-time research faculty at Portland State University's Regional Research Institute for Human Services and co-director of the Academic Autism Spectrum Partnership in Research and Education, where I conduct community-based participatory research with the autistic disability and mental health communities with a focus on social service interventions. Um, and my field is system science. My aim is science for social change always. And uh, importantly too, I am both a member of the autistic community and an academic researcher. So I've got, I've got my feet in both worlds there. So engaging with the autistic community, doing research with the autistic community, why would you do this? Why does it, why does it matter? It takes time, it takes effort, it takes money. What's the point? So I'm, I'm hoping that I can give in my short time today a little bit of inspiration and um, evidence for you of why you might wanna do this. So first of all, autism research really affects the quality of our you know, autistic people's lives. <laughs> so this could be very directly, for example, by developing and testing an intervention that could have either helpful or hurtful, hurtful outcomes, but it could be indirectly too. For example, by perpetuating or disproving a false stereotype about autism, which could then have ripple effects in how we're treated. So second, on the other side, we affect the quality of your autism research. If your research participants don't want to cooperate, if they don't understand your study instructions or find the research questions that you have asked or the materials that you've created irrelevant, unethical or offensive, then that's going to impact your ability to recruit and it's going to impact the quality of your data. So um, community involvement could really be the difference between a successful intervention or research study and one that failed to understand what was even useful to us in the first place. And third, authentic equitable partnerships matter because collaborating can lead to positive change, right? A well-constructed study that answers research questions that matter to the autistic community can lead to high quality research that can positively affect autistic people's lives as well as your work as a researcher. So I'm talking about partnering with the autistic community here and I wanna take a moment to just define what I mean by that phrase. So I'm talking for the most part about the community of people who have been diagnosed as or who identify as being on the autism spectrum. A community is not a population. So I'm not talking about the general population of people with an ASD diagnosis or who identify as being on the spectrum. A community is a group with shared history, values, culture, language, and symbols. It provides safety, support, and a sense of belonging. The autistic community is not monolithic. You have the same community, diversity and squabbling as you do in any large international community. But we are a community that is held together by these things. And community offers more and knows more and holds more than an individual alone. Okay, so what does this actually look like though? What, what does autism research with the autistic community look like? So I wanna give an example of the value of these academic community research partners in Aspire's recent study on autistic burnout. And if you're interested in the scientific findings or the clinical implications of that study, just yesterday I did a, a full hour um, talk with the New Jersey Autism Center of Excellence that's on YouTube. And I think a link should, we'll, we'll be providing a link in the chat um, or you can contact me where I go over the, all of the scientific findings from that study. So that is available, but I'm not gonna get into it in this talk. Um, so Aspire uh, is a research group that was founded by myself and Christina Nicolaitis, who I think gave a talk last year or the year before, and me. Uh, she used 
the Autism Journal Club idea to lure me into a social interaction because she's very wise. And we read a couple of, of articles on autism research and had a lot of complaints that it was not relevant or useful to autistic people, that there were issues with research design, stigmatizing questions and language, potential harm both directly and indirectly, and also recognizing that these complaints are not isolated to autism. These are complaints that all marginalized populations really have with research because we lack good representation um, both in research and in society in general. So we decided to stop complaining and do something about it. And that something was to draw on community-based participatory research, which again is a type of emancipatory research. It was developed inside of public health and it was developed to deal with inequities that minority populations experience in research, just like we were finding with the autistic community. Um, in CBPR, community members are co-researchers in every phase of the research. Uh, it's very equitability based. So the idea is that the lived experience and community knowledge is respected on the, at the same level of power and this, the same level of value as academic expertise and book learning. And so Aspire community partners are involved in all stages of the project that I'm going to give you this example of and really everything that we do. So here we are, this is what we, what we look like literally. Um, we've been around for 14 years and running. We're a team of academic researchers, autistic individuals, family members, healthcare providers, disability services professionals, um, and we have partnerships with multiple universities and community-based organizations, as well as members of the autistic community at large. So we look like people. Um, our currently active areas of study are autistic burnout, which I'll use as an example in this talk. I also do, I'm the PI on projects related to autism and professional employment. Um, we have a long running healthcare um, series of studies, autismandhealth.org is, you can find our tools. We just started an exciting new project to um, collaboratively with the community adapt and test a, a set of autistic patient reported outcome measures for health services research. So going back into like the, the burnout study and what does collaboration with the community look like? Um, starts right off with the community is setting the research agenda by the community's priorities. Um, so for us, autistic burnout is this term that's often used by the autistic community to describe a state of incapacitation, exhaustion, and distress in every area of life. People have attributed it to terrible outcomes, loss of work, skills, health, relationships, quality of life. There's been discussion for decades on blogs, social media, and community spaces. And it's a significant source of distress and a very high priority. Um, people have urgently asked for research and clinical communities to address it. And you don't have to take my word for it here. If you just look up hashtag autistic burnout on Twitter, you'll and scroll through, you'll see a little, you know, a segment of, of, of that urgency. However, the published research on autism and burnout is all on family, teacher, and caregiver burnout, and very little is known empirically about burnout in autistic adults or what can be done to prevent or relieve it. So the research clinical community either didn't know about it because they weren't connected up with community, with the autistic community, or they weren't connected up enough to realize that how important it was and had little interest in addressing it. So our community partnership and the community engagement in our research knew about this gap and helped to uncover it and find an important area of study that was being neglected. So in the next stage, um, community engagement, I feel strongly creates trustworthy, accessible study materials that I'm not saying you can't create without community engagement, but I think it's a lot easier and a lot um, more of a sure thing if you do. So our group collaboratively created all research materials, um, interview guides, survey instruments, including a brand new measure of autistic burnout that I'm writing up the final paper on now, very excited. Um, recruitment flyers, recruitment plan, consent forms. Um, and then I think really importantly, community involvement helps potential participants really trust the study and the study team when they know that people from their own 
peers were part of creating something, they're excited about it and open to it in a way when they're, they could be distrustful of, oh, you know, researchers are always getting it wrong. Um, and it also helps to make accessible experience appealing and ethical research materials because people are thinking through like, would I be able to understand this if I saw it? Um, so being able to get those really good materials and all of that community trust, I feel leads to really smooth, effective data collection. Again, not that you can't get this otherwise, but hey, it was, <laughs> it was a, you know, we filled our qualitative sample in about a week and I kept, you know, getting many, many, many more people who wanted to participate than could fill our sample. I could put them on a list for the next phase of the study. It was great. Um, we got really rich personal interviews, personal stories. People really opened up and gave us data that I'm not sure that they would have if they hadn't been talking to folks who were involved in community. Um, our survey data was good, clean, people understood it. We had no missing data points in the qualitative write-in about you know, anything else you wanna tell the researchers. We had just really, really grateful feedback for doing this, this area of study. And then um, we also got a really strong member check to our qualitative findings from the survey. So it was great. Um, I think that there's better smoother research and better data integrity, or at least for less effort, um, if you do these collaborations. So impact, as far as positive change, we're still really early in this line of inquiry. However, there is some evidence of the impact already. Reddit Science featured our paper and it received um, 46 and a half up, thousand upvotes and close to 2000 comments that were positive, like on social media. Um, is supportive, grateful, excited that someone from the scientific community was actually looking into this. The paper received over 150,000 downloads in June alone, which just baffles me for a piece of academic writing. Um, the paper includes a qualitative synthesis of the strategies that autistic people found helpful in reducing um, or, or uh, recovering from autistic burnout. And nearly every week, I received some grateful direct communication from autistic people or their family members, either for empirically validating their experience or for helping them find strategies to potentially help their situation. So the long-term impact of this research as a positive agent for change in people's lives really remains to be seen, but I think we're off to a good start. And uh, we hope very much that other researchers, clinicians, and community academic collaborations expand our work and use it to further make um, address this urgent issue. Uh, so our use of a CBPR approach, some visible values that I think are evident here, um, let us not only get a, a, you know, a good idea for a research study, but it enabled us to really listen to the community's passion for a critical topic that might not have seemed as important if we were just looking at existing research and clinical understandings. It helped us with swift, effective recruitment and data collection. It helped with data integrity. And the response from autistic people and their families has been incredibly positive. So in short, the value of participatory autism research comes in when from the community side, community priorities, knowledge, trust from peers and authentic inclusion pair with from the academic side, scientific expertise, sound research methods and power sharing to create science that has a positive impact for everyone. Um, I really strongly encourage researchers to seek out and grow these authentic partnerships with the autistic community. But I also really strongly encourage autistic people and members of the autistic community or community-based organizations to seek out researchers who are willing and able to authentically include them because there's a lot that can be done together. Um, Aspire has recently compiled all of our inclusion and collaboration resources into an online inclusion toolkit to help um, that. And this is, I know that Christina talked very much about how to and some of the how to do things, but these resources here actually 
brand new 2020 resources. So we've got the online collaboration toolkit on our website. We have recently published an inclusion guideline paper and that's for including autistic people both as co-researchers in your research work and in studies as research participants. And then we've also this year published a paper on creating and adapting accessible survey and data collection instruments. So there's two new how-to papers and a whole collaboration website that, um, that is out there to help. And yeah, so um, I wanna say thank you to the Aspire team and to all of our research participants and members of the autistic community who have shared their wisdom and experience with us. Um, as, as Susan mentioned at the start, I'm the associate editor of Autism in Adulthood. Uh, please consider submitting. Uh, we're an academic journal, but we also take literary perspectives from clinicians and, and autistic people and family members. So um, there's a wide range of articles and we'd love to have your, your papers and some contact information for me. And again, if you're interested in the scientific findings from our autistic burnout study, we have the first paper out as well as the talk that I gave yesterday. There's some links and you can contact me for them or, or I'm hoping they're, they're going into the chat. So that's what I got. Please, um, I hope something inspired you or made you think that this might be worth it. And I encourage y'all to, work authentically and power share together. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Raymaker. And I think we'll we'll take one question from the chat that, that Patrick's been manning for us. Yeah, oh. yeah. So I see a question here in the Q&A that's asking about these important adult findings and wondering about extending them to children. So do you think that there is autistic burnout in children? And if so, how can parents know when their children are undergoing it? So I, I absolutely do. I don't, I can't speak very much to very early childhood because that just, that wasn't in our data, which doesn't mean it wasn't happening. It just means it wasn't in our data. But I can say that in the, we did a series of um, uh, qualitative interviews with autistic people about autistic burnout and many, many, many of them we first, the first question we asked them was just tell us, tell us the story of your experiences with burnout. And many of them started their stories at puberty and talked about how that adolescent period was the first time that they had this experience. And for some people, it's actually what led them to get an autism diagnosis was that burnout during adolescence. And in the in this, the study findings, we have kind of a conceptual model of the attributions where people talked about what, what dynamics they felt led into their burnout. And if you think about puberty and look at that model, it's a perfect time because it's a time of great change and transition, but it's also a time when expectations change radically and you have a lot more expectation put on you while you're going through developmental chaos while you're going through transitions like from um, grade school to high school. So it's a, it's kind of a, a time that's really ripe for it. Um, I would say, I, I, I know that we're really short on time here and I wanna geek out about the entire study, but, um, but I would say if you're interested in how to maybe recognize it, I would go take a, a good look at our paper because it's got um, the characteristics that people described and we have a definition, an operationalized definition in there and uh, some information that might be able to help you or give you some clues. But I will say that our data strongly suggests that puberty is, um, is a time that is particularly people are particularly at risk during that time. The UC Davis Mind Institute was founded in 1998 with the promise to reduce and prevent the disabilities that can be associated with autism and other neurodevelopmental conditions. Every day, our clinicians and researchers make progress on that promise. 
Our groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other conditions associated with disability are helping affected individuals achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website or our social media platforms to find out more about current studies, upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.